Hi, this is Annie Grace, and welcome to this Naked Mind podcast. Today, I'm so excited because we have a guest who is going to help us dive into other areas of addiction beyond alcohol. And uh, it's so important. It is so important, especially with everything that's going on in our culture, um, specifically in the opioid crisis. So welcome, Dr. Leslie Cole. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, that's awesome. So let me, let me give your little intro, and then I actually wanted to kind of dive into some of your story, and then we can get into your work and, and where it's going. So, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this because I don't want to get it wrong, and I think it's just so great. So um, <clears throat> board-certified addiction medicine and internal medicine physician, uh, you've been working with opioid-addicted people, and you have an ebook coming out called quit pain pills without withdrawal, which, oh, so powerful and so important. How to break free from your dependence and finally wake up feeling normal with the website quitpainpills.com. And um, so I'm so excited to get into all of that. And I have, you know, a very, a very, very brief, but very almost dangerous history with pain pills myself that I have not shared before that I will share today. So that will be cool to go into. But Leslie, first, let's start with you. Like where, where did your interest come? Like, what is your story? Well, um, my story is mostly around food and having um, not exactly an addiction to food, but more of a compulsive, uh, it, it would probably be co closer to anorexia uh, with a little bit of bulimia where it would I, I was uh, preoccupied with thinking about food, preoccupied with thinking about weight, preoccupied with thinking about, um, oh, I don't want to get fat, and yet I want to eat this entire cake. I want to eat this entire cake. What is, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And um, I had it a little bit in high school, and then when I went to medical school, it kind of went in the background. But in my 30s, it totally came back with obsessing about, am I, am I fat? Am I, uh, am I gaining weight? I've got to control what I'm eating. I've got to control it. And the more I tried to control it, the more I was unable to control it. And I did not see, I couldn't see at all that it, was, it had come back and was bothering me until a friend of mine um, I mean, I just flipped open a book at work because I was working with a guy who was having some nutritional issues. And on the flip side, it talked about eating disorder and how it can sneak up in highly educated people who had very strict upbringings. And I went, oh my gosh, this is what I've got. And so I reached out to a friend of mine who um, worked with eating disorders, uh, his therapist, um, and ended up talking to several therapists and really started thinking about what was going on in my own mind. And where I resonate with your book was realizing I am using this food for an emotional feeling and it is a lie. What is the truth underneath everything? What is the truth? This piece of cake is not answering my need for people. It's mm -hmm. not working. And so, um, I started really writing, journaling, and thinking about what are the underneath drivers, underneath purposes, underneath things. And then um, probably a couple of years ago, um, it, well, actually five years ago, I um, just went full into addiction medicine because it was the same kind of thinking. And I understand it so much more, and I love talking about it, um, and I really value patients and people who share their openness with me. Oh, that's so cool. That's so powerful. And I think that's, I mean, that's really the crux of it, right? Is that we're reaching for something that we think is going to change our emotional state or that we've 
um, not even that we think it is, but we've taken it and it's somehow worked in the past. It's done something inside of our brains that signals to our brains, oh, do that again. And then suddenly yeah. we're you know, in that spot. Um, and so in, in your addiction medicine and in just seeing the landscape that's happening right now in America specifically and even globally with, with addiction, you know, how did you then really decide to like narrow in on pain pills? Because that is, I mean, it's such a, oh, it's, it's just such an important topic right now. Um, I, for the 10 years prior to working in an addiction clinic, um, I worked in uh, a men's prison and a women's prison. I was the medical director for Tennessee uh, men's prison and a Tennessee women's prison. And what I kept seeing over and over again was how much pain people had and how desperately they were trying to help their pain and how the emotional pain made the physical pain worse. And so I started thinking about pain. And then the second thing I noticed was people needed to be believed. And so they needed to be believed that they were actually having pain, um, that their circumstances were as bad as they were. Um, and so somehow it wasn't that I thought, oh, I'm gonna work with pain pill addiction. It was kind of a providential, someone calling me and saying, hey, we're looking for a doctor and um, this nurse practitioner says you would be good at this. So I thought, well, I'll give it a try and ended up just loving, loving working with um, the people. That's so cool. So, um, <clears throat> you know, my own little journey that I alerted, alluded to earlier was, Really, I don't remember when the first time I was prescribed Vicodin was, but I have, I have pretty looking teeth, but they are a mess, like a hot mess. Like I think I've had, I want to say like 12 or 13 root canals. I've had uh, an apicoectomy. I've had all sorts of stuff. So most of my back teeth are actually now root canals and crowns. And so they used to prescribe Vicodin for the pain of that. And so I... Um, got a prescription for Vicodin probably first when I was in college. And it was interesting because the, the whole pill made me sick and it made me throw up. And so I, I stayed away from it. Oh no, sorry. I got prescribed Percocet and that whole pill made me sick and throw up. And so I stayed away from it and said, I can't have Percocet. And then they gave me Vicodin and the pill still didn't make me nauseous. But if I took a half of one, I didn't feel nauseous. And it was interesting because I don't, I never felt like it really helped my physical pain that much but it helped me not care about my physical pain. Like it helped me yeah. feel better about the physical pain. And so I ended up, you know, really kind of harboring those pills. If I got 15, I'd break them all up into halves. And then over the course of however long, whether it was cramps or whatever, I'd, I'd know I'd have those pills. And I remember probably, I don't know, it was probably six or seven years ago now when I started to learn everything about addiction and stuff like that. And I started to get curious. I remember feeling like, wow, I could take one of these pills every single day. And at the same time, I had a really good friend from college who called me up out of the blue and told me she had been in rehab for Vicodin. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is a real thing. And I can see how that just slightly euphoric feeling, you don't feel drunk, you don't feel high, you don't feel anything, but just better. You know, it just gives you this slightly euphoric feeling and you it's so hidden because even if you are, you know, smoking a bunch of weed, you've got like eye, like redness and you, you know, you're not really present and you can tell. And if you're drunk, obviously you can tell because you smell bad and the alcohol is coming out of your pores and you're slurring your words. But like with this, it's so insidious because you can do it and it feels really, um, it doesn't feel as, as psychoactive. You just it just takes the edge off everything and makes everything slightly better. And so I ended up taking, um, I'd have, you know, over the years I'd get a, um, I have a root canal and I'd get the prescription for like 10 pills or whatever. And then I'd have those last like a year or whatever, and just take them on the very rare occasion when yeah, like I felt, um, it was usually a physical pain. I'd always justify it to myself because I always had these guardrails in my head. Like I knew it was a concern. So I justify it to myself with, okay, if I'm really in physical pain, then I can take one. 
And so usually it was um, with cramps that I would like be like, okay, I'm really in pain. I'm going to take one or whatever. And even to this day, which I haven't had a Vicodin in years, but like even to this day, if I take, a, if I have cramps, I have that like in the brain feeling of, oh, things are going to get better. Like it's crazy. Like there's a connection of an emotional, things are going to feel emotionally better because I have that pain that tr used to trigger me taking that half of Vicodin. And, um, and yeah. so I do remember at one point, and it was probably, oh gosh, it must have been five or six years ago, but uh, it was definitely during the point of um, me feeling super stressed out in my life. And I was like, you know what? I could just take that without any pain. And I did, and it made me feel better. And I did that probably three or four times. And then there was like this huge warning bell inside my head that was like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, no, 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 no. And so I went and I just flushed it. And I like, just like, couldn't do it. I just flushed it. And I was like, nope. And, and I won't, I won't take the prescription because I like could see where that, you know, it was very similar to my yeah. relationship with alcohol. Like I wasn't this rock bottom drunk, but like I could see where the train was going. And I was like, okay, this is flirting with fire and disaster. Like this could, you just have these moments of clarity, which so often we ignore, but I was really yes. thankful to be able to like not ignore it. Yes, yes, yes. That's, oh, I understand. Okay, so let me share a little pain pill, uh, my own little pain pill history. I had not had a pain pill because for whatever reason, I'd been healthy, nothing had happened I, except I had Tylenol co with codeine with a uh, wisdom tooth when I was 18 and I didn't like it. So nothing, 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 no pain, no nothing until age 40, well, until 2017, last year. And I get diagnosed with breast cancer. And I have been working with people addicted to pain pills for now four years. And I'm thinking, what is going to happen? I'm having a double mastectomy. I'm going to have, you know, all this surgery and all of this chemo. And am I going to get addicted? Um, well, so that was a thought in my head that then was gone. Um, as soon as I got into the surgery and all the thinking about the cancer. So... I get prescribed, I don't know what I was prescribed in the hospital because I do not remember it. I remember one time of waking up, I'm having a migraine headache because I've not had coffee in two days. I'm having a migraine headache and I'm just hurting. And I hear someone go, prescribe her some Valium. And so I am for the next week on I think Percocet and Valium, and, and these are the things that are, I, I see every, all day long that people have become addicted to, but I felt like I needed it. I, I couldn't have done a mastectomy without Percocet and Valium, but about week three, a nurse is saying to me, you're not still needing the Percocet, are you? And the way she said it, I think, hey, well, I, am I getting addicted to it? No, I think I still need it. And so I'm taking them. Then I think, okay, you got to get off this. You don't want to be addicted to it. But one morning, I have a terrible morning, and I go to my husband, oh, my gosh, I'm just going to take a couple of Percocet. And I hear myself two hours later say, wow, I feel normal, normal, normal. That's the word I've heard a thousand times. And all I could think of was thank you to all my patients who've told me their stories because it was like a warning sign to me of you are right on the edge. You're yeah. now needing these to feel normal. And that is what I hear every day. And that's why I put the word normal in my title of my book because people need to feel normal, which I think is actually another way of saying, I want to feel well, a sense of well-being. Right. 
Right. Because we should. I mean, if you look at like children, like they feel well, you know, it isn't until all this like, yeah, absolutely. So I have, um, there is some research that was done by a doctor called Dr. Kevin McCauley, and he was actually addicted to pain pills and he's done, um, shoot, what is the name of it? The great pain? No, shoot. I'm not going to remember it. Um, but I'll come back to it. It will come to me. But anyway, the crux of his research basically says that we have this hedonic system in our brains and it goes up and down and we overly stimulate, stimulate the hedonic system with, um, with drugs, with pain pills, with alcohol, stuff like that. And then what happens is that that can be fine, except when we're in periods of intense stress, whether it's physical stress and physical pain or whether it's um, emotional stress and emotional pain, all of the things in our hedonic system that would bring us back to normal. So the things that you and I, like I have a list of things and um, just to, like, if I'm feeling bad, I believe now at this point in my life, it is my number one job to feel better before I do anything else. So if I'm having a bad day and I cannot yeah. sit at my desk and I'm just like feeling upset, it is my number one job to do whatever it takes healthily for me to feel better. So I have this list of stuff, going for a walk, going back to bed with a book, going and watching Netflix, going on a run, like whatever it is, you know, I have this list of things. And what Dr. McCauley says is that when you are in periods of intense stress and intense pain, those things that you used to do to feel normal are not going to register anymore. They will not make a difference. So then if you have a drink during that period of time, all of a sudden your breath said, wait a second, that made me feel normal. And boom, addiction is born because your brain has learned that that is the thing that it needs to break through this period of intense stress because of how toxic you know, stress can be when it's dealt with incorrectly. And so I think I, I've always had this sort of theory in my own head and that, wow, what are we doing with opiates and narcotics for this type of pain because that is we are prescribing it in the moment that the yes. human is feeling the most vulnerable to addiction because it is in the moment that the human cannot do anything on their own a walk isn't going to help you feel better from a double mastectomy right like you're just can't yes. do it but um first of all i'd love to know your thoughts on that theory and then second of all i'd love to know your thoughts on like are there other medicines that don't have the narcotic effect that would actually be helpful or not? Are we just doing this because we have no other choice? Mm. Um, well, I think, okay, this is great, great questions. Um, that theory, I think, is, yeah, I think it's legitimate. I think it's legitimate because when we have a, anytime we have a pain and then something makes us feel better, we get attached to that. There's an attachment. The brain goes, oh, there we go. Pain means that. And so I do, that's interesting about the opioids. I I mean, having been now in so much pain, I don't know what I would have done. Um, I don't know what I would have done right after my surgery. Um, so, but I think that theory is legit. What I think is that maybe with the opiates, they do really help, um, I think, for a short period of time, maybe a two week period of time. Um, maybe a three week period of time, but then we need to be able to transition people off of opiates and um, give them another way to deal with their pain. Now, I am really a believer in non pharmaceutical ways to deal with pain. Um, so, as far as medications that help with pain, I do think there's potential for. Um, the CBD part of the, you know, like cannabis oil. Um, um, and, you know, there are NSAIDs and different, different types of antidepressants. But what I, what I really think is that one of the things that makes physical pain intolerable 
is emotional pain that gets attached to it. If the event mm -hmm. that causes the pain has an emotional component to it, then it seems to me that that physical pain is intolerable to the patient. I've talked to so many people who've had, um, have had different types of pain, different injury, and they say, somehow I can handle my tooth pain, but I cannot handle the back pain. There's an emotional component. So I, um, yeah, with that, I think there needs to be therapeutic healing of that. That's some of what I go to go, uh, go talk about in my book is healing the emotional components of the physical pains. But opioids help with the emotional pain. I think that's the main reason people get addicted to it. Yeah. And that was certainly my experience. Like it wasn't that I didn't feel the pain. I was actually yeah. surprised how much they didn't seem to help with the physical pain. It was that I didn't care about the physical pain anymore. It wasn't, it wasn't front of mind. Um, a sense of kind of being okay was front of mind. Even so I could mentally deal with it, but I didn't remember it really lessening physical pain. Yeah. So it's really interesting because this is another kind of, of my own little ideas, but I'm going to give you an example. And I, I, first of all, I completely agree with you. My aunt has been taking CBD oil for a tremor in her hand, which I know is different than pain. Um, and it has been phenomenal for her. Her tremor like literally is visibly almost gone. And then a really close friend of mine, she broke her leg skiing last year in like three places. She was prescribed opioids. She's very, I mean, she's very good friends with me. We're very, we talk about this stuff all the time. Um, so she's very aware of the addictive nature. And a few weeks after that, she actually switched to CBD in order to manage it. And it's like, she swears by it. She thinks it's absolutely incredible. So I think there's huge, huge potential. Um, I think one of the things that I was going to share is not about the CBD part of the cannabis plant, but about the THC part. So yeah. when I, um, when I was, when marijuana first became legal in Colorado, I knew I was drinking too much and I was like, okay, well, here's a legal thing that is clearly not as dangerous as alcohol that I'm just going to switch it in, right? Like I'm going to deal with my stress now, not with a bottle of wine, but with, you know, um, by smoking or eating or whatever I did. And so one of the things that I noticed right away is it really seemed to help my nod. I get super car sick. And so every time we were in the mountains driving on, on curvy roads, it felt like right away it would help my nausea. Fast forward about a year when I realized, okay, I don't want to be actually smoking as much as I am. And I want to, I want to kind of be quitting all of these things because like yes. I realized none of these are good for me. I um, would like, we'd be driving up in the mountains and I'd know I was going to be super car sick. And it was like, okay, so I'd, I'd smoke for that. And then that would be like my one time that I would smoke would be for car sickness. Right. And so I ended up feeling nauseous. Like I started feeling nauseous, like almost every time we'd get in the car. So it would be like, I would just be driving on a straight road and I would be feeling nauseous. And I was like, what is happening? How is my car sickness getting so much worse and blah, blah, blah. And finally, fast forward, fast forward. I make the decision. I don't make any connection right at this point at all. Um, I just think my car sickness is getting worse and I'm just nauseous every time we get in the car. It doesn't matter if we're going to the grocery store. I feel like if my husband's driving, he's going to drive badly. I'm going to, I feel nauseous. So I end up, um, you know, cause this is my one time I'm, I'm letting myself smoke and fast forward to the point where I've decided I'm done and I'm, I'm leaving it behind. I'm taking like a break. I'm over it. Um, I, about a month into stopping, I stopped getting nauseous in the car. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I'm like, what is happening? <laughs> like, how is this possible that I was so, and now that it's not an option, my symptom has disappeared. And so yeah. I think there's a real danger too, because if we, this whole emotional, physical, and, and we create it ourselves and it happens in our brain, and then all of a sudden you, your brain creates the pain. Like I literally did feel nauseous. Like I wasn't making it up. I mean, I obviously was at some level, but like it was, and I think that could happen with physical pain too, for sure. Yeah. It does. It does. I know it does. Um, I have had, you know, for example, I've had patients tell me 
they had maybe a toothache. And the, um, the patients I am seeing, I'm treating with buprenorphine. And I'll, I can talk more about that in a minute. But um, the, so it helps with pain. But I'll have patients say, yes, I had this toothache for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I tried Tylenol and ibuprofen. And, and then finally, I took one Percocet and the pain went away. And I, my, it feels, I can't explain it, but I have this compassion thinking about that part of the brain. It almost feels like, like a child or a puppy or it's this thing that says, please just give me one more pain pill, please. And, you know, I will say it doesn't make sense that a tooth condition would go away after one Percocet, especially if you've got buprenorphine that is blocking your receptors. Um, and if you had an actual pain problem, like a problem with your tooth, I mean, it would keep going on when Percocet wouldn't work. So I do think the pain, um, the, the body may create physical pain, but what I think is we're not in touch with our emotional pain. Yep. Yeah, it's so true. Oh, it's so true. So yeah, I'd love to talk more about your method and, and buprenorphine, buprenorphine specifically, yeah. um, because I did, I spoke at a harm reduction conference, I guess it was about two and a half years ago now, and I was on a panel with um, people and, and there's a lot of controversy about this. And, you know, I, I know kind of where I think you and I are pretty aligned probably in our point of view about it, but I also would love to just, you know, air it out and, and just talk through it for people who, who don't know. Right, right. Okay, so with buprenorphine, um, well, with, with opioid addiction, it's called opioid use disorder, but opioid addiction, if you go to a rehab, and there haven't been a lot of studies, um, but there are a few studies that show if you go to a rehab and then you get out 30 days later and you take nothing, you're trying to be what they say clean, um, you have a relapse potential of n over 90% within the first year. So mm -hmm. that, and when a person relapses on opioids, after being clean, their tolerance is going down. And so it means that the amount that they were using before could kill them. And then with all the different types of stuff that's out there now, they could die. And so um, it's slightly different than other addictions. You can die from a relapse so quickly. You can with other things, but with this, you really, it's really scary. So buprenorphine is called a partial agonist. It um, does not give the big euphoric thing that opioids, um, regular opioids give, but it hits the receptors. And so it just stops the escalating tolerance. And so what I see every time, I mean, I see this every time in every single patient, you get a person on a dose and then they stop and they feel normal. They say, I feel normal. I'm able to go back to work. I'm able to, you know, pay my bills. I'm able to, I'm not buying anything on the street. I'm, you know, uh, my family's having me back. It's miraculous. And so my thought with buprenorphine is it doesn't have to be a forever thing, but I think while the person is starting to think about their thinking and challenge their beliefs about underlying need or drive for opioids, while they're getting over their fear of withdrawal, while they're changing their phone number, people, places, and things, that buprenorphine is a wonderful thing to take in the in-between period. It's not, um, it's not swapping one addiction for another because it's not an addiction with the increasing tolerance, the inability to take care of your stuff. Um, but it is, people do get dependent on it and have to be weaned down slowly and gradually. And people do wean down and they get off of it and they do fine. 
And it's amazing that we have this medicine, that it works, that there's very little like negative side effects. Yet how I understand it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, doctors are actually limited in the numbers that they prescribe. And they're even somewhat looked down upon in the medical community for prescribing this medicine that can save lives. Yes. Yes. <laughs> We're limited to 200. I can only see 275 people. And we've got there are 20 million people in the United, in the world who are addicted to opioids. Um, and there aren't that many addiction doctors and there aren't that many people who want to treat people who are addicted. And I think the reason doctors are looked down on um, is because the patients are looked down on. I think if we could see that it was a, dis a disease or a disorder that's as life-threatening as cancer, we might, we would not um, stigmatize or degrade or think so poorly about our patients. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Oh, we have a long way to go, but there's so many people who are kind of entering this space and talking about this more. And, you know, it's even, it's getting attention, um, which is, which is just so, so good. So um, a few other things is, you know, in terms of your work, if somebody wanted to work with you or find you, I guess, you know, your website is probably, probably the best first step. The best first step is, yeah, my website at www.quitpainpills.com. Right now, I'm also working at Cedar Recovery in um, Mount Juliet, Tennessee, and um, uh, Columbia, and also Pathway Clinic in Springfield. So I've got several different places. Um, but yeah, the, probably the website's the best place to start. Okay, awesome. Very cool. And can you work with people from all 50 states or? Well, I... Right now, I need to, my malpractice only covers Tennessee, but I'm looking into that to see if I can work like telemedicine with people from other states. So that's a hope for the future. Yeah, that I think would be incredible. I mean, I, I feel like telemedicine is going to be just a real game changer for the face of addiction um, specifically. So, but people by by getting your ebook and really digging into it, they can also have the tools they need to talk to their own doctor. Correct? Exactly. Exactly. Yes, I want every yeah. All these things that we've talked about and thinking about the emotional pain and how this is not a moral. It's not a moral failing. I think that's one of the main reasons I wanted to write the book was I wanted people to know. They weren't failures. They weren't moral failures. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's the key. We need to understand that like this is not something that we did. Like this is how our brains are actually structured to keep us alive and evolving and moving forward. Um, and it yeah. is it is nothing, you know, human beings who are in pain, who are prescribed opiates will get addicted. It's just how it, how the brain works. Um, yeah. And so I, I feel like that's really important. And I also feel like just talking about this is so important, especially, you know, listeners may never have, have tried opiates or they may have been prescribed it once or twice and maybe it made them nauseous like Percocet made me nauseous or maybe they do like it, but you know, it's definitely just as soon as their prescription's done. Um, but just the education and awareness of knowing how quickly that can happen, knowing that like the opioid epidemic is not just heroin addicts on the street junkies. No. It is an epidemic that is affecting everybody of every class and every socio social economic, every racial um, area. And every. it is just like so so heartbreaking and it can happen to anyone like none of us are immune and i think that's really important it's not your fault you're not immune and so just to treat these substances with just the utmost amount of caution and really even even if the doctor because the doctor not necessarily going to um 
maybe even fully understand it because they're not necessarily addiction certified like Leslie. Um, but also they might not always have your best interest at heart. They might just want, you might be, just be another number. They might just want to get through it. If you ask for another prescription, they'll just tend to believe you. They'll tend to go for it. Um, and so it, it, you very quickly can can get into a bad situation. So having your own best interest at heart of knowing, okay, yes, this is prescribed to me. Yes, I have five more pills in this bottle, but also I just took pills for the last three days for stress. So I'm flushing it down the toilet. Like that was that was me, the doctor in me taking care of me, right? Like my own internal healer, I guess. Yeah. And so I think that's really, really important. Yes. Um, I have one more question for you that I'd love to touch on because one of the, the medicines that I took, and I know this is not in the opioid area, actually, at least I don't, I don't know for sure, but um, Xanax. So Xanax was something that uh, I was prescribed to relieve panic attacks and anxiety. I was on all sorts of different antidepressants. I was on acetalopram, Wellbutrin, Xanax, and then I was also prescribed Ambien for when I was um, traveling and I couldn't sleep and stuff like that. And a lot of people, ask me, um, well, in quitting drinking and dealing with the resulting anxiety, my doctor prescribed me Xanax. And is that in the same class in terms of its addictive nature? How dangerous is it? Like, I don't, I don't know the answer to these questions whatsoever. I know I took it. I don't think that I felt the same sort of pull that I felt with Vicodin. Um, but I also probably only had 10 in entire life. So it was very minimal um, thing. And I know people could, you know, take a few a day, perhaps. So I'd love you to just give your opinion on that since it's something I get asked. Yes. Um, um, well, first of all, I just have to say again, I, I, I'm so grateful for your being so open and honest. I mean, you're so open and honest and you, you're helping so many people. I, I just want you to hear that and I admire you um, okay so Xanax Xanax is one of the most addictive benzodiazepines Xanax and Valium they hit bang and you get this feeling of oh I feel better um, they aren't addictive for everybody but for some people they are so addictive and especially somehow the combination of opioid and a Xanax. Um, I think opioid, well, opioid addiction itself will cause anxiety. So does alcohol addiction. Both of them end up having anxiety. And Xanax, bing, just, you know, treats the anxiety. So a lot of times we'll see that combo. So for, I would avoid um, Xanax. I would avoid prescriptions for Xanax. Um, if, uh, if someone felt like they needed to take a um, benzodiazepine for some reason, I would not take it for longer than um, maybe three weeks. Uh, if you find yourself addicted to um, uh, Xanax or some type of benzodiazepine, see somebody go in to an addiction physician and we I would actually recommend if you feel like you're addicted do not stop on your own because this is one of the addictions that you can die from stopping if you try to stop on your own and you were to seize you could die so I would say for um, a benzodiazepine Xanax type addiction go inpatient, get detoxed, and then you will be on a very slow taper of something like clonazepam, which is not as addictive, it's still in the same category, but you will be on a slow taper so you don't seize, you don't have panic attacks, and meanwhile, your anxiety can be treated non-pharmaceutically. Okay, that's so good. Thank you for telling it straight. Thank you for laying it out there. And I will make sure to, you know, pass that along when I get asked that question. So that's really, really yeah. helpful. Yeah. So let's say it's just been such a pleasure, such an honor getting to know you. And um, I really, really appreciate it. Is there anything else that you, you'd like to share? Um, 
I just that for every person who struggles with this, notice the self judgment, notice the judgment in your brain and know that it is not true that you are valuable. You are so totally valuable. You're lovable, you're capable, and you may just be hurting more than you know. And it is so okay. Oh, that's awesome. I echo that for sure. Well, thank you so much, Leslie, and I hope you just have a wonderful day. Oh, thank you. I totally enjoyed it. This has been Annie Grace with This Naked Mind Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. You can learn more at thisnakedmind.com. And please remember to rate, review, and subscribe as it really helps us spread the word. Thank you.